And uh, now we turn our attention to financial Phil from Ameriprise Financial and the Marius Group of Financial Advisors, Winchester Avenue, Martinsburg. Good morning, Philly. Good morning, guys. How are you all? We are well, Phil. Thank you. Yeah. Have you voted yet, Phil? I did. I early voted on Friday. You want to tell uh, us? John had gone down the boat, and he came back and said, "There's no line. Go get down there if you want to go now." So I took off. So you're going to tell us how you voted? Are you, Phil? No, no, sir. (laughs) Smart man. I'll keep that. You know what? We don't even talk about that in our house. Yeah. uh, Between my wife and I. It's, uh, we don't even talk about it, So, but we always participate, always. So, so, Phil, I was talking to you earlier this morning at 638 about some changes and contributions uh, from uh, people in the year 2025 for 401Ks and IRAs and such, and I found a few of those numbers. The IRS said on Friday it increased the annual employee deferral limit for 401Ks to 23500 from 23,000 for workplace plans, including 401ks, 403bs, 457s, and such. Uh, In addition, those participants age 50 and up can do catch-up contributions of $7,500, so you can do a total of 31,000. And then there's something for those between the ages of 60 and 63 where you can actually do another almost 4,000 on top of that, Phil. What do you know about that? That is part of Secure Act 2.0, and where that number is derived, it's a 150% of the catch-up contribution. So if you took the, if you're over the age of 50, uh, you can do the additional 7,500. You're allowed to do the additional 7,500. However, when you reach the age of 60, now what I don't understand is why did they stop at 63? But 60, 61, 62, and 63. You can do 150% of that amount. So your catch-up contribution for 2025, if you are 60 or between the ages of 60 and 63, is 11250 in addition to the 23500 So that's a lot of money that you could put away inside of your 401k plan. That was part of Secure Act 2.0. Now, what isn't as widely available right now and we're still kind of waiting. So Secure Act 2.0 made a lot of changes. Secure Act made some changes, and Secure Act 2.0 made a lot of changes. And they, and they're kind of trickling in as when they make them effective and or mandatory. But one of those changes, as we talk about catch-up contributions, is if you're over the age of 50, and if you are making catch-up contributions. So if you're at 50 and above, and you say, "Hey, I can do more than the 23,000. I want to save more." And your income is over a certain level, and I believe that level is 145,000. Then your catch-up contributions must go to Roth. It's not an option; it's must go to Roth if your income is over a certain level. So this gets really, really confusing, and and that's why the IRS is kind of phasing some of these things in because of the confusion. They have to allow for time for education. So imagine if you're one of those. That are and and we and we support that uh, completely support the Roth contributions. Make no mistake about that. But, however, if you're one of those employees that say, you know, I'm, I'm making catch-up contributions, and your income is over that threshold, which I, I think don't hold me to this. I think it's 145,000. Uh, but if it's over that, then your catch-up contributions are going to Roth. So you need to be aware of that for tax purposes. So when you go to do your taxes. Uh, in the following year where you thought that you had that income deferred, it was not deferred because it went to Roth. Now, I'm not sure if they've made that part mandatory yet because I can't find anything on it, but that piece is coming uh, to to your your plan as well. So what Secure Act 2.0 has done is they've really – some have referred to it as the Rothification of uh, employee retirement plans where they've kind of um, – opened up or encouraged Roth contributions, whereas before you kind of had to go looking for that information. A lot of people didn't even know that they had it available. Well, now they're kind of starting to force dollars into that even more, uh, and this is not effective yet. This is going to take some time, but even more with Secure Act 2.0, they are allowing employers to give the employee the option for the matching contributions Currently, in today's world, all of those matching contributions are tax-deferred. You don't really have a choice, right? So if you're 
employers matching 4% and you make 100000 that's $4,000 It's going to your 401k that you're not getting taxed on right now. It's deferred later on in life. It will have the required distributions to it. It grows and it comes out 100% taxable. So what you deferred and the growth is subject to taxes. So what they're now allowing for, and that this is, will be elective with, employee, with the employers, what they will be allowing for in the future. And I, th- I think plans can do it now. It's just not widely known and it's not widely used. But what they're allowing for is for the employee to say, no, 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 that $4,000, i will go ahead and pay taxes on it. Put it on the Roth side of, of my 401k and allow for that to, the taxes to be taken care of. And now the growth can grow and come out completely tax-free as long as I meet the requirements of 59 and a half and so forth. So a lot of changes that are coming, but the biggest change that faces us next year is those the, the allowances for 60, 61, 62, and 63. Again, I don't understand why they stopped at 63, but uh, you can you could your catch-up contribution is on steroids. Any idea how that works if your birthday – comes in the middle of the year bill i mean is it, if I as turn... long as you turn 60 in 2025 and so if you're 59 today and you'll turn 60 on december the first you will be able to do the 11,250 here's a part of this whole thing i don't get and this is what makes the federal government the federal government i suppose so they put income limits on you for contributions yes. to iras and and roth iras too which makes even less sense to me at least with a traditional IRA, part you know your your contribution takes takes away from your income, so you get taxed less initially when you're making the contribution. So you could, in theory, afford to contribute more because it's not being taxed. So you're not losing thirty percent of it, say, or twenty two percent of it, or whatever you you know what the rate is for for you and your state government. But for a Roth, which is not taxed at the end, but is taxed up front. It takes a lot more of your income to be able to fully fund a Roth because you're not getting any immediate tax benefits. So the more you make, the more the easier it would be to fund this. So to cap it makes it more difficult initially to fully fund your Roth. I don't understand why they cap I, it. I, I, I don't either. It, it's never made a lot of sense to me other than if you were someone that could put uh, 500000 per se inside of a Roth account and go ahead and pay taxes on it. They, um, I, my, my thinking is is they don't want that tax-free growth to sit there and grow and grow forever uh, because right now uh, with Roth IRAs, there are no required minimum distributions. So if you, if you could put, say, 100000 away or 20000 away or what have you, then that growth is always going to be shielded and protected from taxes. So my guess is they're trying to put a limit on how much you're you're able to do that, but I agree with you completely. Now, here's the, here's the the, the really uh, confusing thing about all this is the backdoor Roth, which is very hard to explain, and a lot of people are familiar with them. But if you make too much money and you can't contribute to a Roth IRA, you can make a traditional IRA uh, deposit. You just can't deduct that from your income, so it has no impact on your income because Roth conversions have no age limit or require or uh, income requirements, you can make a non-deductible IRA contribution and then convert that to Roth, seemingly tax-free as long as it didn't grow, the growth would be taxed, so tax-free into your Roth. So you can still get money into the Roth if your income limits are high, and it's, it's very widely used. These backdoor Roths are, are used quite often. So why not just make it easy and remove that, like you're talking about, remove that income limit because you could still do the backdoor Roth. It's just it's just complicated for the investor to do so, and you should, if you're doing those, you should be using someone because they are very complicated, and it takes it takes some explaining to do to your to your friendly local CPA, which will be aware of what a backdoor Roth is. If you just said, "Hey, I did a backdoor Roth," they know what forms to fill out to record it properly, but it's a little bit complicated, and it's multi-layered, and uh, it really 
without purpose, why don't you just remove the uh, the income limit? So I, I, one of the few times we agree completely, <laughs> I agree with that, Rob. Rob. Yeah. No, it and, makes no sense. And the federal government, knowing fully well what the Social Security situation is like in seven or eight years when this cliff hits, you would think they would make it easier for people to save for their retirement where they're not as dependent on Social Security. Yes, outside of their 401. And they've done that with Secure Act 2.0 uh, inside of employer plans. But on the individual side, it's still just as restrictive and difficult as it has always been. All right, Bill, we are into November now. Bill, did you have a question? You looked eager. Yeah, uh, Warren Buffett is selling a lot of his stock. Uh, he's selling a quarter of his Apple holdings, uh, not repurchasing. Uh, should we read anything into that, Phil? A lot of people read into what Warren Buffett does, and, and I would caution uh, following what he does because in a lot of cases it's for Berkshire Hathaway, of course, and with that, there may be a limit on how much Apple stock they have. I don't know that it's it's a, a referendum on Apple stock more so than saying, hey, we've got too much or we're overweight in this particular position or in this particular sector. They could love it. They could say, well, we still really, really like it. We just got too much of it. It's almost like salt. I love salt, but if you put too much of it on something, it ruins it. Uh, it may raise an eyebrow and cause you to look at it, but I would not certainly use that as the sole reason to sell any any individual position because there could be underlying reasons why they're doing so. It could just be a tax play as well. I noted that I think when they last sold Apple stock, he said they needed to rebalance portfolios. Yes, that was part but, of it. It's very but, common. But yes. Apple's only part of what he's been selling. He's selling across the board. Yeah, I think they said he had $300 billion in cash inside the uh, Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, fund that he has there. Mr. Gilstrap? Yeah, I, I know you don't, you're not in the business of recommending stocks, certainly not on the radio. So I'm going to walk a fine line here. But you take a company like Boeing, where they have not had anything good in the news in, in quite some time. Um, how fragile are they in terms of their position in, um, uh, in, in, uh, Funds, mutual funds, funds, mutual fund managers are looking at them. I mean, they, they got the problem with the strike. They have the problem with their spaceship not working very well. They have a problem with aircraft not working very well. How, how much trouble are they in if something doesn't turn their way? As it pertains to mutual funds purchasing, Boeing, et cetera, uh, the, the more issues that they run into as long as there's no fear of bankruptcy, and, and I've heard nothing of the sort of a bankruptcy or consolidation. Uh, a lot of times that will increase their position in those because when you look at a mutual fund or, an, or any type of investment plan, to be able to purchase a, a strong company, even if it's going through some heartache, the ability to purchase a strong company at a discount to its intrinsic value is extremely, extremely attractive to them. So is it, you, you will see a lot of uptick in some cases where they'll insert a floor, if you will, uh, because they, the mutual fund companies and large investment plans won't allow that individual position because they know it's a strong company to fall below a certain level. We saw that with Amazon uh, I don't know if it's a if it's a good uh, uh, comparison, but we saw that with Amazon during Donald Trump's first term. He came out and said something uh, about Jeff Bezos and their shipping. I think it was their shipping was unfair, uh, but he he had said that and their their stock price plummeted. But then all of a sudden, as soon as it plummeted, all of these investment plans and mutual funds said, "Hey, Amazon is an extremely strong company. I know there's dark dark clouds ahead." but they would weather those, and they, the price recovered very quickly. And it wasn't because there was anything in, that happened with the company. It was simply because that price dropped to a, to a point where it became extremely attractive because of its intrinsic value. So in the, back to Boeing, uh, I haven't heard, and we don't do a lot of individual stocks, uh, stock picking, if you will, but I haven't heard anything on the side of Boeing. Their company, the lifeline of their company is in trouble. Uh, they're still, by and large, profitable over the long haul. So these things are dark clouds, but it's still a strong company, and it does nothing more than increase or attract them with, 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 due to the intrinsic value. Financial Phil, how do we reach you for more information today? 
You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. Have a great day. Thank you, guys. Have a good one.